And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Kent Myers, and as you can see from the shot here, Mick Cornett is not here today. He has some business to attend to, but we'll be back next week, I promise. Uh, when we started this show uh, over nine years ago, we named it The Verdict, and it had, we had our roots uh, principally in the law and legal-related subjects. Since that time, as you know, if you're uh, regular viewers, we have expanded considerably beyond uh, the law to other things. Today, we're getting back to our roots a little bit, and for the next two weeks, we're going to do a two-part series on the practice of law in Oklahoma, and we're breaking it down this way. The first show today will be the practice of law in a larger firm in a larger city. We have two guests who lead uh, uh, leading and uh, large firms in Oklahoma City to join us as guests. Next week, we're going to reverse it and talk about the practice of law uh, in smaller communities and in smaller firms so that you can get a nice contrast uh, between practicing law in a big city and practicing law in a smaller community. We hope this will turn out to be interesting for you. Uh, we do today have uh, uh, Roger Stong, the president and CEO of Crow and Dunleavy, and Tom Wolf, the president and CEO of Phillips Murrah, going to join us and talk about their respective practices and the kinds of uh, problems uh, with which they deal. We think you'll find it interesting, and we really do thank you for joining us this morning. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're watching The Verdict. The idea of sending American money out of our own economy these days for foreign oil is madness. Yet we're spending $25 billion a month on foreign oil. America's 100-year supply of natural gas can break this pattern and strengthen our economy. See how it can create jobs, generate clean electricity, fuel our cars, and protect our environment at chk.com. Chesapeake, America's champion of natural gas. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Welcome back to The Verdict. I'm Kent Myers, uh, flying solo today without my co-host, uh, Mick Cornett, who's off uh, doing something uh, uh, good for the city of Oklahoma City, I'm sure. But he will be back next week. Uh, today, we're really uh, excited about doing a show that I've wanted to do for a long time, and we just really never have gotten around to it. And that's to talk about how a law firm operates and how it's managed. And we've got uh, two uh, fine gentlemen that have uh, given us their time this morning to come talk to us about that. On my right <clears throat> is uh, uh, Roger Stong. Roger is president of Crow and Dunleavy. Uh, Crow and Dunleavy has offices in Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and uh, Norman. He did his undergraduate work at the University of Virginia, did his law work at uh, Indiana University, and he uh, is an experienced business lawyer. Is it does business transactions, corporate securities, and the like. Uh, Roger has been with Crow and Dunleavy for 24 years. He's listed in a publication widely viewed as an as a acceptable, uh, valid publication called Best Lawyers. He's listed in Best Lawyers uh, in the United States in a number of different corporate securities type categories. This is his first visit to the verdict. Roger, glad to have you. Thank you, Kent. On my left is Tom Wolf. Tom is the president and CEO of Phillips Murrah Law Firm, did his undergraduate and law work at the University of Oklahoma, 
uh, Tom is a trial lawyer. He does a lot of trial work, both the plaintiff and defendant work, uh, particularly uh, insurance defense work in some cases. Uh, he is um, uh, a member of the Oklahoma Association of Defense Counsel and has uh, uh, won a number of awards from that fine organization. Like Roger, uh, Tom's listed in best lawyers in, uh, in the U.S in a number of categories, including probably the most prestigious litigation category. It's called Bet the Company. It's what lawyer would you hire if your company was on the line? And Tom is listed in that uh, uh, publication as one that uh, should be cons consulted, and I certainly concur with that. Uh, this is his uh, uh, first visit to the verdict. We're sure glad you'd join us. Glad to be here, Kent. Thank you. Well, let me start with you, Tom. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your managerial position is with Phillips Murrow. Um, I am the uh, president and managing partner of Phillips Murrah. I've been in that position since uh, 2002, so approximately eight years. Uh, and the well, way you look amazingly good for being in that <laughs> position that long. Well, you know, I, I'm not so sure that's right. <laughs> uh, and the way our system works, I think I have another year and a half, and then there'll be an election and a determination if someone replaces me. But it's, it's been a good opportunity for me. I've enjoyed it. Roger, same question. Tell us about what your managerial position involves. Well, uh, like Tom, I'm, I'm president of Crow and Dunleavy, and I've been president of Crow and Dunleavy now for, I think, three years. Um, I'm fortunate in, in that uh, I have a number of good people we work with. Uh, we divide things with an executive committee who handle various functional areas, and basically I get to do everything nobody else wants to do. <laughs> it's job security. <laughs> well, let's, let's stay with you, Roger, just for another minute on a, on a related question. You've been in the job now a little over three years, or going on three years. Uh, what's the hardest thing uh, that you have to deal with in managing a law firm? To me, the hardest part of manage managing a law firm, and Tom, Tom and I talked about it right before coming in, unlike a lot of businesses, we don't have uh, dramatic power. We can't, we can't force things to occur. We, we either have the bully pulpit or the ability to cajole people and trying to get a lot of very smart lawyers to go along with you is, is probably the hardest part to me of running a law firm. I've heard it uh, analogized to herding cats. Is there any uh, accuracy in that? There is. I, I always say I've got 60-some partners, all of whom are smarter than I am, so <laughs> it, there's a lot of similarity to the Just cats. ask them. They'll tell you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me ask you, what is the hardest thing that you've had to deal with in your really uh, lengthy tenure? Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, like Roger, we have an executive committee, and uh, I think one of the more, more difficult things is also like Roger, it, it, uh, being the managing partner of a law firm is different than like being a CEO of a corporation or a president of a corporation, because both Roger and I have ongoing practices, law practices, and of course there are times that uh, that it becomes difficult to handle both. But the advantage that I have, like Roger has, is a is a very active. Uh, executive committee that that uh, is involved in many of the decisions in any event and uh, because of that infrastructure I'm able to go ahead and practice law and uh, and be the managing partner of the firm I know there's some some of the really large firms for the managing partner that's all that he or she does and, and I, I wouldn't want to do that I don't think Roger would probably want to do that I enjoy practicing law and, and uh, this gives me an opportunity because of the way we're set up to, to do both Roger, let me ask you, are there segments or categories uh, of the work or uh, responsibilities at the law firm, like perhaps administrative or economic? Uh, how do you break that down, and do you have any help in those areas? We do in, in two respects. We, we break down our areas into a series of functional areas. For example, uh, business development, recruiting, economic, uh, HR, and administrative. And depending upon the area, we either have uh, a lawyer who's assigned as a chairman of that functional area and is responsible for it, which is a big help. And in a number of areas, particularly the HR and the accounting side, we have professional staff that we use. Non-lawyers. Non-lawyers. How about you? We, we do the same thing. Uh, you know, like I said, we have the executive committee, but we also have uh, business development side. We have the accounting side, of course, and, and other sub-areas that are either headed up by lawyers or non-lawyers, and, and uh, they do a great job. And and uh, I think that's the way most larger law firms work. It, it, it's not feasible for one person or even for an executive committee to handle everything because, like I said, you have an ongoing practice that you, that you have to continue. And so we, in effect, spread the responsibility uh, among a number of people. 
Uh, Roger, you, your firm has offices in uh, three locations, I believe. And uh, how difficult is that in, uh, in fostering what I will call a firm culture or a firm mentality or a relationship when you have uh, various offices and partners that you don't see very often? Well, it, it, it's definitely an issue because, uh, yeah, in, but in some sense, uh, you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder too. In some sense, the other offices are easy, easier to manage. We, we try and do a number of things to address that. And first and foremost, when we opened the Tulsa office, um, we looked for, uh, Tulsa and Norman, we looked for people we had a longstanding relationship with that had very similar personalities and firms that had very similar cultures. We also made an effort to uh, send lawyers from our office to those offices and then we try and schedule a number of events to have have people together and it's worked pretty well now how long have you had if you if you can recall this approximately how long have you had the Tulsa office? we've had the Tulsa office since about 1989 so what's and, that 20 21 years now I think that's right and Norman uh, Norman I want to say is closer to 15 uh, uh, Tom your firm is just in Oklahoma City uh, that, well, it, it's our primary office in Oklahoma City. Okay, we also have a Norman office. Oh, as well. I'm sorry. Well, no, I overlooked that. That's I no apologize problem. to Phillips. <laughs> Accepted. <laughs> and particularly the Norman lawyers of Phillips, <laughs> who I hope will turn back on their sets. Go ahead. Uh, but I, I, I think I'd echo what Roger said that if, for us, and I'm sure for a lot of firms, culture is a very important thing. Yeah. Uh, whether you're dealing with the satellite office or whether you're dealing with the main office. and. Uh, in our Oklahoma City office, we have three floors, and it, uh, there are many days and, and unfortunately sometimes weeks that go by. I don't see some of my partners, I don't see some of the attorneys and some of the staff, and so we try to, uh, from time to time, have gatherings, whether it's you know after work or even during work, because it's important for the cohesiveness of the firm and, and just for the type of atmosphere that people want to come to, that people want to work in, that you maintain that culture and you maintain some, uh, collegiality. And it's, and it's easy not to do that, or it's easy to forget that, because, frankly, everyone's really busy with their law practices. We're going to jump to a break now. You're watching uh, The Verdict with uh, Roger Stong and Tom Wolfe. We'll be back in just about two minutes. I remember walking into the academy and seeing the Highway Patrol core values, the professionalism, you know, the courage, the bravery, integrity, and I realized that those are some of the same qualities that I was taught by my grandmother that the Chickasaw Nation valued in their people. We had uh, received calls of heavy, heavy rain. I mean, it was the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen in my life. We had seen the white pickup truck with the two elderly people in it. There was no means of escape. And looking down at these people, you know, you could see the terror in their eyes. And we knew we had to make a move or, or these people would probably die. And I reached down and grabbed their arm to help pull them up. I remember thinking, these people are gonna live. You know, this is gonna work out. I appreciate this citation, but that's what we do. That's what we're expected to do. I'm glad that I was able to carry on that tradition of bravery and courage under strife. What's your idea of security? A good paying, sustainable job, a solid economy, less dependence on foreign energy? We can achieve it with the help of one industry, American oil and natural gas. It creates energy, jobs, and a strong economic base we can rely on. The new technologies open vast reserves that will supply our energy needs far into the future. Because security, by every definition, is worth protecting. Kent Myers here on the set of The Verdict. Uh, as I've indicated earlier today, Mick Cornett's not here today, but we'll be back next week. Uh, today we're visiting about large law firm practice in a metropolitan area, and we're dealing uh, with uh, two firms, the Cron Dunleavy firm and the Phillips Murrah firm, uh, that have multiple offices. And we have their presidents here today. On my right is Roger Stong. Roger is the president of Cron Dunleavy. On my left is Tom Wolfe. Uh, Tom is president of Phillips Murrah. Let me uh, start out with uh, Tom. Uh, 
one thing that uh, I'm sure is always a consistent concern with the law firm is conflict of interest. Uh, when you have uh, one client that has a particular matter that may be adverse to another existing client. I mean, how, just how do you uh, handle such matters, particularly uh, when you have more than one uh, city involved? Right, and you asked me a few minutes ago what's one of the more difficult things to handle as managing partner, and I, I would put conflicts right up there. Uh, you know, you, you have competing interests if you're representing one client and another attorney in the firm gets a phone call from a, a potential client or an existing client and it turns out you have a conflict. How do you handle it? What do you do about it? Uh, you have, you have the, the potential of uh, the clients becoming upset because they don't want to be, have their attorneys conflicted out. And of course, you have the attorneys that are wanting to represent the clients. Uh, you know, the bottom line is where we come down on is there are ethical rules that dictate how to handle those matters and we always just follow the rules. Uh, now, in many instances, I think it's helpful and, and we do this. We, uh, and we think it's ethical to do this. If, if we have a conflict, we will tell the client, obviously, if the client, if the two clients are willing to waive, then, then they do and we can move forward in some instances as long as the rules allow it. If that won't work, then we will take well, care. Well, you couldn't be on both sides. That's of right, not on either. But you, you can be on one side or the other if both clients wait. Th that's exactly okay. right. But if we have to get out of it or if we can't get into it, then we will refer the client to another firm uh, in order to handle it. And truthfully, uh, internal clients are, are a tough thing to handle. There's no question because of all the feelings, like I mentioned. But it, you know, in Oklahoma City and outside of Oklahoma City with offices, it's a little bit away uh, the way the system works. I've received a number of, of referrals based upon conflicts. In fact, you referred me a case a few years ago, and I send clients to other firms. And so, even though uh, it, it's not something you really want to deal with in, in the end, I, I think it can be a positive for everybody. Well, it's a pretty dangerous area, is it not, if you make a mistake or if you ignore it? In a prior uh, firm that I was with, there was a mistake or it was ignored and uh, the, uh, the firm had to get out uh, after the client had spent a lot of money to get to a certain point, and that is a disaster. So you would rather address it and, and spend your time, and if you have to take adverse action up front, rather than wait till later on, because that can really get you in a, in a bind. Well, Roger, tell our viewers when you have a firm with uh, several offices and uh, over a hundred lawyers uh, whose phones are ringing fairly regularly, you hope. You hope. Um, uh, what, how do you uh, at Crow handle uh, heading off or handling conflicts? Well, we do several things, Kent. Um, first, as, as you know, we have a computerized database where we have all the client, we have all the client names in it. and you. You hope that when people get the phone call, they run the names through the through the database, and you're turning over the you're turning over the conflicts early. The other thing we we do as a matter of policy, we have certain areas that we, as a matter of policy, just don't get involved in because they they present conflicts for us. As an example, we only represent them. I think Phillips is probably the same. We only represent the management side in labor employment disputes. Um, we don't te we don't tend to do personal injury because it causes us conflicts with with some of the healthcare clients. We try and come up with those simple rules to to build expectations and head off problems. Then um, the issues are a little deeper than just conflicts because you have you have the basic business issues too about who do we want to represent separate and apart from the ethical rules. And we have a business acceptance committee so that if there's a, a disagreement. It's heard by a, by a group of lawyers, and people tend to think they're getting a fair, impartial discussion and, and decision by a number of experienced lawyers. Well, let me give you a hypothetical and walk me through how, how you'd handle it. Lawyer A's best client has been aggrieved by Lawyer B's best client, and Lawyer A and B are partners in, in your firm. They both come to you and say, we want to represent our respective clients. How are we going to handle this? What would, what would you do about it? Well, I'm, I'm hoping the hypothetical doesn't presage something I find when I get back to the office. Well, I've, I've been meaning to tell you, but we'll do it after the show's over. Go ahead. Largely, it's as I mentioned, it's 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 a process of cajole. It's a process of controlling. What we would try and do is talk to lawyer A and talk to lawyer B, um, go through it rationally, talk to them about about what the you know what the respective interests are of each of the parties, try and find try and find what common ground we can, try and see if it's a place where, as Tom mentioned, we could do a waiver. 
it's there's no one one solution that fits the problem, Ken. It's mostly a case of dialogue. Okay, let me stick with you for just a minute on a different subject. All right. Uh, we all, of course, are personally familiar with the recession that the country's been in a while. Uh, without getting into internal secret uh, information that uh, I'm not trying to bring out with this question, how has the recession affected the practice of law in Oklahoma uh, as you see it, or, or particularly your firm? I don't think it, it hasn't affected us very much economically. I'm, we're fortunate. Um, we're, we tend to be more uh, fortunate is probably an overstatement, but we tend to have more litigators than we do business lawyers, and recessions tend to feed the litigation side of the practice. We've also been lucky in that our business lawyers have established relationships and the practice has stayed pretty solid. I, I think the thing we've noticed the most is a little bit of slow payment from clients. They seem to be managing their receivables a little better. And then the other thing we really notice is that we're getting presented, uh, we always get presented good talent, but we're getting presented lots better talent, people from outside Oklahoma who want to come to Oklahoma, Ivy League law schools, big firms, um, you know, people are looking for that now. On the recruiting side, it's, On the recruiting it's, you side. seem to get, be getting a, a deeper pool of, uh, from which to draw. A deeper pool of more qualified uh, potential hires, yeah. Yeah, Tom, what would your take on that be? You know, uh, if, if you read some of the national magazines, uh, what happens on the East Coast and West Coast uh, in connection with law firms, like anything else, I think is more dramatic. Uh, the West Coast and East Coast firms you read are having layoffs and, and things are really becoming problematic for them and have been for the last year or so. We're not, we haven't experienced that. Uh, like Roger said, uh, I, I, I mean, maybe it's because Oklahoma's economy doesn't have those swings, probably is, but we haven't seen much of a swing. I would say... It's because I, of Mick Cornett. It, absolutely. That's the reason you have it, but go <laughs> absolutely. ahead. If he was here, I'd congratulate him. Uh, but I, I think that uh, what we see is that the transactional slide has slowed down a little bit, but the, the offset that the litigation side has picked up. And uh, I mean, really, that's, that's the way a large firm is supposed to work. Let me uh, address the second part of what Roger uh, mentioned, and that is a, a, perhaps a deeper pool of, uh, of more qualified applicants. Are you seeing the same thing at your place? Absolutely, and I think part of it is that, frankly, that some of the applicants that would have ordinarily maybe gone east or west or south, uh, those opportunities really aren't there now. And so we have, uh, in, in some respects, a pick of the litter. And we're seeing a, a deeper, better, talented uh, group of attorneys coming out of law school that are wanting to stay in Oklahoma and wanting to work in Oklahoma City than we've seen in the last 10 years anyway. Well, Roger uh, referred to it in one of his answers about how, and as did you. On the both coasts, uh, law firms are not only uh, delaying applicants for a year after they've been selected as a new hire, but they're uh, in some cases laying off that's right. People, we don't seem to be seeing that in Oklahoma City to any large extent, do we? No, we haven't, and we continue to grow. And we've got a new attorney starting with us uh, in August, uh, just getting out of law school, and we're continuing recruiting. Uh, it, you know, we may uh, not be making as many hires, perhaps, as we made in the at the at the peak of the economics of the country, but. Uh, we're continuing to grow, and uh, we've been very fortunate to not have to deal with layoffs or some of the more uh, significant issues that the, that the coast firms have had to deal with. Roger, in the minute or so we have remaining, you take about 30 seconds, if you will, and tell us what's the single biggest challenge you see facing uh, your firm in the next decade? Uh, for us, the single biggest challenge unquestionably is transition, and we're an institutional firm. We've been around since 1902, and we're on, depending on how you count, our fourth or fifth generation, and moving clients and experience down to new levels of lawyers is our most significant challenge. So transitioning challenge. business to the younger lawyers coming in? Transitioning business and knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Tom? Um, I, I think that the biggest challenge that, that our law firm and any law firm uh, is taking on right now is, is expectation of, of clients that are becoming much different. Clients are becoming much more aggressive in connection with fee arrangements and in connection with how law firms are compensated. And I think you have to be a little ahead of that, otherwise you're going to get dragged into it. And I'd rather be ahead than get dragged into it. And I think that's the biggest issue we're facing. We're going to have to call time on that. Thanks to both of you guys. Thank you, uh, you've been watching uh, this segment of The Verdict with uh, Roger Stong and Tom Wolf of Crow and Dunleavy and Philip Smurra. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back for a final word.
good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to The Verdict for our final segment. Uh, Kent Myers uh, flying solo today. Thanks so much to Roger Stong and Tom Wolf for joining us today and talking about practice in a large law firm. We will uh, be talking next week about practice in a smaller firm. I've got three websites I'd like to refer you to. The first is uh, for Crow and Dunleavy. It's www.crowdunleavy.com. For Phillips Murrah, if you want to contact Tom Wolf or his folks, it's www.phillipsmurrah.com. And of course, Come on to Verdict.tv and tell us what you'd like to see. For Mick Cornett, I'm Kent Myers. See you next week. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.